the true philosopher is morally obliged to go back into the cave at the risk of his own life. And Plato even describes it in that book that the people who believe in the shadows might want to kill you. They will dis they will want to destroy the person who comes out saying what you thought was real is is fake. And you ha you so to do it literally doesn't work. If you give people direct facts, it never really works um, because that's not what they need. You know, the, it, it, this is where the, the, the poetic spirit, the, the, the question of developing a capacity of utilizing irony play metaphor is, is extremely important for anybody who's going to try to be effective at helping their fellow citizens develop an internal infrastructure on their own because the people have to want to do it. It's not a question of putting things into their heads. They have to internally awaken something, a hunger themselves, a passion for discovering why what they thought they believed was false and then pursuing uh, a, a study on their own terms. You cannot force them into that. So that the only way to do that, and this is why people like they're good teachers, right? I, I've had maybe a couple of good teachers in my life, but what makes these good teachers good teachers is that they actually cared. They, they, they treated the students as if the students had a soul and could discover things on their own. They didn't just feed them answers and tell them, get the right answers on the test. They were being playful. They were, they were treating people like human beings. Um, so that's what we all have to just get used to doing and get and, and practice getting better at it all the mm -hmm. time and, and, you know, have patience for, like Jesus said, you know, forgive them, they know not what they do. <laughs>
why would that happen? Why would the why would a government that I thought was a a democratic government? I'm in Canada, but you know, pretty much the same thing. Uh, kill its own people in the thousands and then cover it up. The the amount of control that would have been required to do that and then keep covering it up for years um, was astounding. And uh, and it would it it was at a certain point that I realized since I was studying, fo- I, my focus was on the arts. I realized that it was more, it was less important to prove the mechanics of 9-11 themselves, because I was, I was spending a lot of time getting sucked into the conspirophile, myopic, like, let's just nitpick it forever. And I realized that it doesn't matter what details are proven about this being a fraud. It was more how people were thinking and also how they were feeling within this artificial uh, socially engineered culture that was the problem because you could give all of the people somebody all the facts but they would still be fools you know they would still fall for another another lie as we see now with the current uh, pandemic right i mean a lot of the people who are currently just eating up the mainstream uh narrative of, like what is really going on why did we shut down civilization for two years um, there were people who were anti-war in Iraq. There were they, they were pe- many of the people who are believing the, the current garbage believed in, uh, you know, they believed that 9-11 was an inside job. And yet they many have just completely, the, the quality of thinking was not addressed. So, you know, th- that's pretty much my intention is to, to contribute something back into human society's zeitgeist in such a way that, that people can avoid being fools at a time when it's very important to not be a fool because that'll get everybody killed. Um, and hopefully I believe in a, in a, that humans, humanity's destiny is something very beautiful. I think we have in our cards wired into our nature, the capacity to be one of the greatest, most beautiful, brilliant species ever uh, seen, at least on this, on this earth. And uh, you know, to, to actualize that will require certain, recognitions of of suppressed elements of our history Mm -hmm. um which is also why i focus a lot on history and and producing the books and 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 writings that i do fascinating um you know matthew the reason i'm asking is because sometimes i had those uh, conversations it's not only me but maybe you know that know this from yourself this is what i love about you you know in between you know your lines you know or or in between your talks or episodes or, or interviews, you always say, you know, the, you emphasize the creative potential of the human being, um, you know, in, in just paraphrasing, uh, you know, in, in short. And there's sometimes there were moments in my life where I'm like, and I've, and I've been, you know, like yourself, maybe not that deep like yourself, like especially historically, but uh, going really deep into the rabbit hole. And, and, you know, and then after years or even some decades, you know, uh, you know, you look into the mirror or whatever, or you have some conversation like, you know, sometimes I wish I wouldn't know all this because it makes you crazy, you know? And especially you you feel like a real outsider. You feel like a, you know, a outcast or what do what you call an isolated person, like a total lunat- lunatic, you know, conspiracy theorist, <laughs> you know, not, not to mention, you know, where, where this terminology comes from, from the declassified <laughs> documents of CIA, uh, CIA and FBI. But, um, and, but on the other hand, you know, uh, it's uh, but 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 it's fundamentally important to understand the cause and i think this is what you do this is why your work is so fundamentally important because before we talk about the creative potential the solutions the focus on the solution this is why you know we are so obsessed with bitcoin you know we the bitcoin community this is why you know i you know i told you last time it's so important for me that you get in touch or you somehow get i this is why i asked jeff Booth, but i think he couldn't make it today which is on short notice, I wanted him to have at least for half an hour or so together with you together. Um, uh, so, you know, you sort of, um, I think you would, you know, be a perfect complementary to one another, you know, and, um, and, yeah, and and and, but it's well, what I was trying to say is that it's important to understand the root causes. You know, the bigger to have the bigger comprehension, like uh, to connect the dots. You know, and that's why your your um, uh, your work. You know, the research you do and everything you write, you talk about, is so fundamentally important. Uh, because, uh, but but you know, I have the feeling that people, especially lots of people who might be listening for the first time or might you know get in touch with this with these topics for the first time 
it's a little bit too much. You know, they can't handle it because their worldview, you know, I don't know whether you know, Professor, you know, who's, what's his name, Dr. Matthias Desmet, you know, from Belgium about the mass formation. Didn't you talk to him like, oh, oh am I mixing? I've never, I've never spoken to him, but I've listened to his, his podcast or his interviews. And yeah, he's, uh, his insight has gone viral in a good way, I think. And yeah. uh, it's giving people an extra edge to understand the sort of mass hypnosis, uh, which is really spread uh, around the world. Um, and by understanding it, you're better able to, you know, put a name to it, identify it and, and you know, remove yourself a bit from that. Um, very important. So I'm glad that that his ideas are uh, are spreading. Um, and sure enough, you know, if you read the writings of um, a lot of the, the very influential social engineers who in many cases, if, you know, people people get turned off by the term conspiracy theory. And as you pointed out it's become a bit of a bad word by design. Um, most of human, not most of all of human history has been shaped by uh, intentions, goals, and ideas with people with power working t together um, for common interests and common ideas, uh, whether for good, because sometimes conspiracies are actually good. They're, they're not all bad, um, though people will often define them that way. And, uh, and very often for evil, for evil ends, uh, the enslavement of the masses, the keeping of the masses in the ca in Plato's cave, be believing in shadows, so to speak, you know, metaphorically. Um, now, one of the key figures behind a lot of this in the 20th century has been Bertrand Russell, who was a, a leading social engineer who put a lot of his ideas into motion as a high level, upper level manager. And he made a point that in a proper scientific dictatorship of the future, and he was writing in the 1930s at uh, this point, that the masses, the, the vast majority, will have very strong convictions about a variety of things, but they will not know where their convictions came from um, because we put them there, is what he didn't say there. Um, he, his ideas were really applied vigorously at the after World War II. Um, him and, you know, he even put a, put out a book called the scientific outlook where, um, you know, <laughs> uh, Aldous Huxley's brave new world in many ways, there's a lot of evidence that it, that it plagiarized the ideas of, uh, Russell's scientific outlook, you know, a society run by a scientific, a scientific eugenics based society of a perfect, uh, caste system of alpha pluses, alphas, betas, gammas, epsilons, deltas. You know, that, that are social engineered in a laboratory to have certain attributes and that in order to keep the whole system in place, you have these upper level higher controllers um, who have to ban certain ways of thinking. And there's a there's a little dialogue in uh, in uh, Brave New World between one of the characters, John Savage, who sort of has lived outside of this system of controls and is brought into it at a certain point, And one of the leading social engineers, uh, Mustafa Mond. Um, who describes why we cannot let things like the Bible, like Shakespeare, um, into the general population. He, he describes how certain scientific discoveries might seem exciting, but we cannot allow their, their being brought in because they, get, they, they bring up the question of causality. And Mustafa Mohn is very clear. He says, causality is not permitted, unfortunately, in the system of, of our world because the ultimate good is stability. And when you bring in causality, that introduces instability because you don't know the answer to final cause. So what puts a process in motion? So mechanically speaking, this is, this is the thing. Um, the way our, our whole school system, our culture is wired is to get people to focus on reductionism. You have like, let's say, um, a car that hits somebody, right? Um, somebody dies. A reductionist will be like, well, what caused that person to die? Well, they would be like, oh, it's this car that weighed 2,000 uh, ton or two tons driving at 40 uh, or 100 miles an hour. And uh, it was caught. What caused the car to do that? Well, it was caused by the, the engine being revved in just this way. The wheels ru running this way, this amount of gas being burned per second, uh, th these pistons going. And you could just do this forever, uh, a reductio ad absurdum. And the causality that the person would always miss, which is metaphysical because they're obsessed with things you can measure, taste, see, smell. Um, the five senses are all that possesses them and how you can measure things in the five sense, sense domain. Causality doesn't exist there. It exists only by breaking out of that 
and asking the question, well, what was the intention of the person driving the car? Oh, that was the husband who saw his wife uh, cheating on him, you know, and he had this intention, which is a meta, where is the intention located? It's not, it's not anywhere physical. Um, that's an elementary, you know, that's not a conspiracy. That's, that's doing something by design. Um, that's, that is outlawed in the, in the, the mental landscape of somebody who has been processed through the type of education system that has been designed to do just that. Um, and that's what Ma Mustafa Moen tells John Savage. He even says, you know, this is a, an interesting, uh, he brings out a scientific study. He's like, well, this, this person has a lot of talent, but we have to send them to the island because uh, they're, they're dangerous <laughs> and we have to, we have to ban this. So this is the sort of thing that's resulted in people saying, oh, you believe in intentions governing processes in history in, in, in your world? You're, 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 sounds like you're a conspiracy theorist. Sounds like you're a domestic terrorist. You believe in intentions. That's crazy. So, you, I mean, you might feel crazy sometimes or wishing you don't know what you know. Uh, but the reality is, I mean, most people have been led to believe that the shadows are real. And so part of the um the downside of having denied the shadows in a world where everybody believes in shadows is that you might feel like a bit of an outsider but you know that's that comes with the territory and it's it's been like that for most of human history it's not a new thing in our world this is look at you could see evidence of that thousands of years into the written records uh and that's and the, it, human history has really been a battle to bring society out of the cave by by individuals who who are able to see the, the a higher light that that cast the shadows outside of the cave and who have been consistently trying to because you cannot communicate to people literally and even in plato's uh famous uh, republic in book seven you know where he talks about the cave allegory he even makes the point uh, using the voice of socrates that if you have come to, to break out of the cave and 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 m modify your your eyes to now recognize true existence rather than its its uh its lower level shadow the true philosopher is morally obliged to go back into the cave at the risk of his own life and plato even describes it in that book that the people who believe in the shadows might want to kill you they will dis they will want to destroy the person who comes out saying what you thought was real is is fake and you, you, so to do it literally doesn't work. If you give people direct facts, it never really works um, because that's not what they need. You know, the, it, it, this is where the, the, the poetic spirit, the, the, the question of developing a capacity of utilizing irony, play, metaphor is, is extremely important for anybody who's going to try to be effective at helping their fellow citizens develop an internal infrastructure on their own because the people have to want to do it it's not a question of putting things into their heads they have to internally awaken something a hunger themselves a passion for discovering why what they thought they believed was false and then pursuing uh, a, a study on their own terms you cannot force them into that so that the only way to do that and this is why people like they're good teachers right I, i've had maybe a couple of good teachers in my life but what makes these good teachers good teachers is that they actually cared. They, they they treated the students as if the students had a soul and could discover things on their own. They didn't just feed them answers and tell them get the right answers on the test. They were being playful. They were they were treating people like human beings. Um, so that's what we all have to just get used to doing and get and and practice getting better at it all the mm -hmm. time. And and you know have patience for like Jesus said, you know, forgive them. They know not what they do. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's an interesting tangent you you've been taking because I was going to go somewhere else, but 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 this is a really insightful. Um, also, well, what do you call it? I mean, for, I mean, I'm not into philosophy, but when you when you explain it in this way, it makes total sense. You know, I listened to to uh, to an interview with uh, this this Dr. Desmet, you know, who is actually bringing out a book now, the psychology of totalitarianism. Mm. First in I don't I think is it in Dutch I think whatever or you know Belgium. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and then later in English, and he had a talk on uh, on, an, on some podcast with together with Dr. Malone, Robert Malone, you know, uh, the co-inventor uh, of the mRNA uh, technology, and uh, Dr. Peter McCullough. 
And what was really, I mean, it didn't surprise me, but it was like, like uh, being aware of, of, of these processes, like how this mass formation psychosis, even though he said he didn't, he didn't start off with that, or he, you know, we, we got to be careful, like not to be stigmatizing with these words, you know, so <laughs> uh, because you don't want to like, you know, we don't want to uh, give like sort of, sort of aggressive, I, I, I'm just paraphrasing him, uh, sort of give a aggressive potential to yeah. these, you know, to these people who are in a sort of a psychosis or hypnosis. And the point I'm trying to make is that he said, what is interesting is that people who are more, you know, the intellectuals who are more academic, more educated, these are more, these are the people who are more susceptible um, to this form, to this process of whatever we want to call it, you know, uh, fear, you know, fear porn <laughs> and, and mass formation psychosis. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, and you said, you just, I think you said something like, how can we, or the, you raised the question also in a way, how can we, you know, approach this? How can we open up? You know, it's not like, you know, you put the facts on the table. This is not how it works, right? Um, maybe I think it would, I would even go so far to, to say, you know, humor, uh, stand-up comedy, you know, anything that is funny, that, that opens the heart, that oh, yeah, opens yeah, it emotionally. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and on the other, on the other, on hand, you know, Matthew, oh, yeah, on the yeah. other hand, uh, because I was just thinking of your wife, Cynthia Chung, who did an excellent job, by the way, on the Corona Investigative Committee, and I can only recommend to my listeners to watch that because it's also been translated into 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 German for the German speaking folks, um, and you know, to offer the solutions, you know. So this is the cause; these are the root problems, but these are the solutions which people don't even have an, a notion of because I was surprised that. Viviane Fischer and Raina Fülmich, you know, the uh, the organizers of this Corona Investing Committee, I had the feeling they, they, the comments they made, they were surprised that the solutions are already here and and technology such as meta, uh, weather modification is already existing like for decades now. And mm -hmm. I'm like, how do, how do people like these people, you know, who are like so knowledgeable don't know about this, you know, but it's good, you know, then now it's in the open and people are going to start talking about it. So, yeah, I just yeah. wanted you know to tie this together. Everything, um, yeah, absolutely. No, no, it's great. No, the two points that entered my mind based on what you just said. Number one, on humor, I, I think that anybody who has not uh, watched some of JP Sears, he's a, a somebody who makes these brilliant uh, videos on um, on YouTube, on BitChute, everything uh, from California. It, watch it; it's brilliant. And and what he did in this little five minute skit, um, where he has himself playing a couple of actors at a swimming pool. And uh, one represents this totalitarian Gestapo-like character demanding his uh, his um, uh, what do you call it a, a, a vest? A, a oh, life, okay. life jacket. They're like, "Where's your life jacket?" And he's like, "No, I'm I'm good. I've I've taken swimming lessons. Thank yeah. you." He's like, "No, you can't go in the swimming pool without a swimming uh, without a life jacket." He's like, "Well, it, it's really it's very shallow water. I, I could actually I, I can't drown in it. It's, I'm I'm taller than the water, and I've taken swimming lessons. I'm good. Thank you." So he just goes on polemically and uh, uh there's a series of videos actually where in the next one he's he, something happens a few weeks down the line the guy's now wearing a life jacket finally and and uh the same character the same little gestapo guy is there when uh, when he wants to go into a swimming club and he's like where's your second life jacket <laughs> he's like i already have a life jacket thank you and this person <laughs> has like three life jackets <laughs> and but what he does is it, it's it's so it bypasses the domain of lot of pure of your logical sentinels and it goes into it strikes at the a, a domain that is deeper um and funnier and has more impact i find than than reading uh, a book about the logic of why COVID is a fraud or something. I, don't, I hope by saying this, I didn't get your, your video striked, by the way. Um, so just on that point, humor, yes, definitely vital. And that's why Jonathan Swift as well with his uh, polemics and satires in the 17th century about eating babies, you know, he, he didn't himself actually believe you should eat babies when he was talking about his modest proposal. He was polemicizing in Britain. Uh, he was against the totalitarian depopulation agenda of the British aristocracy that was pushing a program of mass enslavement and famine by design, which was resulting in mass infant mortality. And he was saying, well, look, if we're going to do this, we might as well, like, you know, come up with some great creative recipes to do something with the babies. And I mean, this was powerful stuff. What he did, he destroyed, he eviscerated and it, the, the entire ruling establishment's uh, immoral ethic. And he did it well. It's hilarious and disgusting and hilarious, but really good. So anyway, these things stand the test of time and they're vital. Um, on Cynthia, 
and and her uh, work at the coronavirus uh, committee. I agree with you. I was I was quite surprised too that there wasn't more awareness that many of the discoveries that we um, ha we have access to are people. They just did. People don't know. Even very well informed people are not aware that uh, that these things exist or. What if they are aware, they are only aware of their negative application exactly. of the atom and of like yeah. the use of weather modification. Obviously, we know that a tool is a tool. A hammer can like build your house or kill your neighbor. Um, the question is the the knowledge of the atom, the knowledge of ionospheric um, weather modification is not going to just disappear. It's not going to go back in the bottle. The question is, are we going to uh, have a society of wisdom that utilizes these things for the benefit of nature and of human beings, or are we going to have a society of enslavement that will use these things to destroy and hurt uh, human beings and nature? And so, yeah, a lot of these things, uh, people are, are freaked out about overpopulation and limits to growth. And Cynthia did a great job just destroying oh, the fantastic. argument that we are overpopulated. Yeah, really. you know why? Um, I think that the, the thing was, uh, what was, it was a little bit baffling because uh, Viviana Fisher started, I mean, sort of, you know, as, as a concerned citizen, it's like, oh, you know, couldn't it be like dangerous to put things into the, and she, I think she was talking about, she was thinking about geoengineering, you know, all this military civilian, you don't know. I mean, there's a lot of intransparency yeah. and, yeah. and, and I was, and I'm like no this is this is about like using uh, the physics of the of the atmosphere sort of you know to to turn is you we're not putting anything any whatever like chemicals or toxic things into the and so i think there was this, either she misunderstood or she thought oh this is like you know we, we're affecting like the whatever mm -hmm. you know like the, the climate the weather or or, or the, the the air that we, we breathe so and then, yeah. Uh, yeah, she she talked. I mean, she presented it like fabulously, like all these other technologies. I mean, at least um, you know when it comes to the publicly accessible knowledge and technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, first of all, it's totally underfunded. We know that. Otherwise, we would have we would be so advanced, even in the nuclear technology. You know, oh, yeah. not to mention plasma technology, fusion technology. I mean, who knows? And this is the thing I also wanted to talk to you about. But, you know, we can take it one step at a time. Like, um, you know, you talk about um, you talked about, you know, this uh, the military. You often talk in your article about the I don't know what it's called or, or whose whose acronym it is like like abbreviation like military industrial um, think tank media complex or financial complex or whatever was, like that was a, Ray, Ray McGovern who came up yeah, with that one. yeah so you know it's always the question like cui bono you know who benefits who controls it how much transparency is there how much like top secret stuff is there going on I mean how many trillions and trillions of dollars uh, that's why you know it's important to to have you talk together with Catherine Austin Fitz, uh, you know, who who brings out who is an insider whistleblower and who brings out the Solari report and who is like a total insider. But I think it would be really beneficial for for the population, for the audience out there, for the people out there, to 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 connect these dots, you know, with especially with Cynthia and you. And, you know, and this is what I'm trying to do. I think I'm trying to, to, to connect the dots, help, you know, like bringing you guys together because you have such fundamental deep knowledge and comprehension, but people, you know, you gotta like, you know, put like silk gloves on to, to talk to people because otherwise you are, you know, a woo woo conspiracy theorist, or, you know, you just off the mainstream and that's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge, but I think it's possible. Well, you know, the, uh, Cynthia actually gave uh, this presentation not that long ago to a conference um, in, in Moscow um, on, uh, and it was a futures conference for the Earth's next hundred years. And uh, the idea was the, the, the mandate of the conference was a good one to, uh, to give people solutions, especially young people, to think about the future in a way that was solution oriented. Um, but the problem came after the end of this, this brilliant presentation of these wonderful ways of greening deserts and uh, desalination, terraforming, all these wonderful things, right, that are at our fingertips. The only questions that, were, that came out of the audience were, but isn't this going to uh, disturb the desert ecosystems too much? Don't you have a problem with that? And it's like the lack of imagination. The, 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 there's like an electric fence, an invisible electrical fence that a lot of people have in their mind, as soon as you propose these types of optimistic, reasonable approaches to the future and problem solving, people are not aware. I mean, because it's not it's not on the conscious level. It, it's deeper than the conscious level. It's, it's in the subconscious in many cases because people are not aware 
of the underlying assumptions that have been infused like Trojan horses into their worldview in the course of just their rote education, the memorizing education where you have to get, you know, you go through years of getting the right answers, getting the right formulas, getting the, you never bothered po po getting encouraged to pose the right questions. Like, why is this formula true? Why is this answer true? You were just being rewarded uh, or punished for getting the right or wrong answer on a test with wrong motives to what, be a cog in a machine, to get a job, to be whatever, respected by your family or what, like what? That's not why you pursue knowledge, that, 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 that corrupts you. So people who've been through that processing have, and they're, you know, this touches on why you mentioned earlier the, that many of the most educated people um, tend to fall prey to a lot of this conditioning as well. Um, this, these electrical fences, especially, especially the academics, you know, the, the so-called intellectuals, it's weird, you know, it's weird. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. I mean, and, and, and th I mean, part of this is that if you, you know, you want to be published, uh, you, you want to be respected, you want to keep your job. You, you have to wire your mind into a way where you speak a certain language, which is acceptable to your peers. Even if it's wrong, if you want to be published and you want to have your career, you have to do that and doing, and, and part of the, in the new few decades, the last few decades, part of that process has become consensus, um, consensus opinion as replacement for, for individual thinking. So if you want to have the right view, you have to ask, well, what is this expert consensus opinion that I'm told is the authoritative um, view of X, Y, or Z, whether it's climate science or whether it's geol geology or anthropology or his, whatever, there are these like things that we we are told are consensus views that is this that experts believe and that we have to um adopt rather than think through ourselves and incorporate kind of like a formula kind of like we're being programmed like we're a computer right we we bring this into our programming which wires how we receive all information and if you do this too long um it really mentally and morally uh handicaps you which makes you more inclined to just go along or adapt to things you don't really understand because scientists or all the experts say this. Um, so we are in a situation where um, the, the, what Cynthia brought up, brought up in, in her presentation, which again, people, I guess they could go to the description maybe of this video and, and click on the link and, and check it out. Um, she brought in a variety of things that demonstrates that human beings are actually not like other species of the biosphere. We have similarities, obviously, but, but unlike the other species of the biosphere, we are a creature whose species character is defined not by our genetics or our environment alone. We have those things, but we also have this question of creative discoveries that can translate new ideas that we discover about the laws of nature into new inventions that allow us to, to have more of our people at a higher quality of life with more access to our mental cognitive powers. Um, so we don't have to be beasts on the, on the, on a plantation, the way maybe our, our forefathers had to be by virtue of the lack of, of awareness and technology that they lived in, you know, in the 1700s in Europe or, or wherever we're from, you know? So, um, this can, this this reciprocal quality of the human individual mind as part of a broader species that we're part of that may be immortal we don't know that because we're we're mortal every individual but the species that we participate in has the character where it might be able to overcome mortality and be potentially an eternal species we we don't have every other species that we could see in the in the biosphere tends to disappear with mass extinctions periodically ninety nine percent or more. Of the, of, the, of the species in the fossil records is not here anymore for, our, for, for those reasons that they didn't have the capacity to have, an, have a space program, have a discovery into the invisible but knowable uh, geometries of the atom that result in mass transforming into energy that could be applied to doing work for us. So people, again, the electric fence has been put there to on the one hand, inflame a cynical misanthropic view that human beings are just like, like other creatures of the law of the jungle with the laws that apply to the limitations of monkeys and wolves also apply to us. And we just have to adapt to our limits, stop trying to overcome, live within our means, you know, tighten our belt. This is all part of the conditioning that's been put there to bring us into an acceptance where we think we are willingly depopulating ourselves <laughs> 
because you know we know that we are ultimately destructive to nature by by our nature. We we can do nothing but destroy nature unless, and that's why there's eight billion of us because we're like a cancer. That's what kids are being fed in school when they listen to a lot of the the global warming propaganda or increasingly other forms of propaganda. We're and so to be good to be good people, we have to adopt new modes of of values, new modes of of doing things, new modes of production, like green new deals which ultimately will, as a result of putting our whole society onto a reliance of, let's say, windmills uh, for our energy instead of fossil, uh, let's call it fossil fuel for now, but yeah. Yeah, because I agree with you, by the way, you, I don't, I don't know which podcast it was, was, it was totally like correct. And I think Russian scientists even found that decades ago that, and I can, I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to send you an article privately, not from me, from a nuclear engineer scientist. Uh, who, by the way, had to do also with Russian scientists and uh, where he describes like how how uh, oil, right, this so-called fossilized thing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, actually is regenerates itself, you know, yeah, yeah. because of different factors, whether it be, you know, electromagnetic amino acids, the pressure, the temperature, of course, the, the uh, you know, everything I else. Think and things we just don't know yet, eh? Like yeah. there's a lot, we, we've barely scratched the surface of the earth, literally, like we've barely gone, penetrated down past the crust. We've never gone deeper deeper than like, we haven't even gotten halfway to the through the crust of the earth yet. So everything that we're being told when we see these images in school or whatever, of like the earth like broken up and you can see like these exact layers going down into the, we, this is all speculative. Oh my uh, God, so many assumptions. This is the problem of today's, you know, mainstream or conventional education, science, university, school. I mean, there's so much garbage and trash we've been like implemented with, uh, you know, and then decades later you wake up and it's like, you know, what the fuck have I learned? Sorry my language, but you know, what did they teach us? Who's writing these books? I mean, we've never heard anything that you are teaching. Well, it, it, there, there's there's a lot of very interesting scientists who are very competent. There obviously there's crazy stuff out there because that's what happens when you tell a bunch of lies and you you get people to just you know believe in lies. At a certain point, people are like, well, this is a lie. But then if they don't have a method, they will tend to go to the opposite extreme and just believe in all sorts of uh, zany stuff, which is that that's a that's a net, that's a, a dichotomy that will always happen. But there is a there are a lot of very responsible, rigorous scientists. Many of them are, are I find, um, working along with the the Electric Universe uh, network. It's sort of like an umbrella, a loose umbrella organization um, of different scientists, engineers that have been working together to uh, break free of the standard model. Cosmology. I love that. I love that. Yeah. yeah so so it's, like, so it's it's finally allowed to question the very narrative, the very you know whatever assumptions, assumptions yeah. you know principles that it's yeah. you know, that's the problem. There's, there's a, this is why a, children a don't grow up, you know, like asking questions, you know, yeah, exactly. like <laughs> yeah, just ask, be, get that childlike because a scientist has to have that childlike uh, quality of awe. If you lose that with arrogance, thinking that oh. Our formulas have allowed us to predict it, or exactly when the universe is going to end or when the when Andromeda is going to smash into the Milky Way or you know the exact split picosecond at which the the universe was formed 13.721384 billion years ago. You know, I mean the the amount of arrogance to to say with uh, the language of certainty that we get by listening to uh, a lot of these these modern physicists today who have been put through the system. It, it, it kills your childlike awe because no, honestly, there's, we barely know anything. We know some things, sure, but, but the, we, ba we barely know anything um, at this stage in the game uh, and we never will know everything. We're, we're, we're always going to just increase. See, the thing about human society, I think that the best metric, because people are like, oh, there's no universal, universal values. It's all subjective. It, it's all based on what's useful to your particular culture in time. There is nothing truthful beyond your subjective, personal, cultural, relativistic experience. Bullshit. If you look at every culture, we are all going to die. We all live in the material universe. We all need water. Whether you're African, Chinese, whether you're American, whether whatever, whether you're a thousand years in the, in the future, a million years in the future, a million years in the past, I don't care. You need water. Um, you need to access and increase the abundance of water. You, you, you. There's certain things you just need. Okay, and. In the course of problem solving, your the ratio of your knowledge of humanity's knowledge versus what it doesn't know is going to change, right? So 
you will always be able to increase the ratio of what you know to what you don't know. But there won't be an end. There won't be a moment where the game is over and we're like, okay, now we've we completed the video game. We know everything. Now we're just like automatons who are perfect beings with no more challenges. That'll never happen. And that's the great thing about being a human being is we can participate in this process of creative, dynamic problem solving without any boundary conditions. Because as far as we can tell, there is no scientific evidence that the universe in space or in time has actual boundary conditions outside of which there is no universe or before which or after which in time there is no universe. Anybody who tries to show you a model of the universe, which, which is like a big, big bang and then a big heat death, you're right, bounded in nothingness before and after forever or outside of which, because it's like if it started, it means that there's boundary conditions like a balloon outside of which what? Nothing is containing something. Exactly. That's, and you know, what, Matthew, it's the thing, you know, we've been bombarded, indoctrinated from childhood, like the Big Bang Theory. I mean, come on. What, what, what if it wasn't a Big Bang? What if it was, what if it's still a whoosh? What if it's still expanding? I mean, why, why does this have to be a Big Bang? You know, why, why could it be just, you know, I mean, you know, this is, again, it's so many assumptions, you know, the scientists and the teachers and, and then, you know, they adopt it and, you know, and then they make these assumptions on, on a, you know, on, on this, you know, uh, I would say, you know, false assumptions, but uh, it's a problem. Well, if, it's if a you problem. want, part, part of it is this, is this absence of paradox, because by, by being focused on trying to get the right answers all the time, you lose the ability, the instinct, which is a, a natural instinct one should try to hone, uh, of looking for paradoxes. This is a, a wonderful thing humans do, and this is what, if you read Plato's, Plato's dialogues, they all are honing your, your, your spiritual muscle to, to zero in on paradoxes. What's a paradox? A paradox is where your particular perceptions or assumptions break down when mapped onto reality. So we have a mapping of, of reality based on certain hypotheses that allow us to navigate and make sense, you know, as physical limited beings with boundary conditions as we move through our space and time, right? Like early on, we're babies. We it's, it's a discovery when we realize this thing is something I can control, you know? At, at first, it's like, whoa, this is weird. Um, so you map as you grow. And uh, and sometimes um, when you, you discover, oh, I thought I understood this thing, but I didn't. I, I actually, the universe responds differently to what I thought. And that's a, a great thing to discover because now you're free to, to come up with a better hypothesis that resolves a problem. Now, with with the Big Bang thing, for example, there's a fellow named Halton Arp, okay? Um, Halton Arp was a leading scientist, a, a leading student of Edwin Hubble. Edwin Hubble, by the way, who discovered, you know, he's attributed for having been the person to discover the red shift. When we look at other galaxies, we can see either a red or a blue shift, which you can interpret as being a, 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 an optical Doppler effect. Okay, you can interpret it that way, but did did Hubble say that that's what it was? No, he said that you should be very weary. That could be one possible interpretation. Oh, okay. Oh, right? does it mean, just as a short question, does it mean that, you know, there's this theory that there's so much we cannot see with our eyes? You know, there's a, like a very narrow spec, you know, field within the spectrum with which you can see. Is that like, uh, is it, what that it is? Implication or? Um, no, what, what it is, the Doppler, well, so the Doppler effect is is something we usually encounter uh, audio wise when you have like a train coming at you is what the the example we're often given in school and and you have a certain compression of sound as it's moving towards you and then as it moves away from you you have a, an elongation of the sound waves because it's now moving away from you oh gotcha. so the same thing could be said okay light is also a function of waves it it it, it you have these spherical uh waves with frequencies um that exist as you just pointed out outside of the visual light spectrum of which is just like one octave, right? It goes deep into the ultraviolet and X-ray and gamma ray, and it also goes into um, radio waves, microwaves beyond that are very long wavelengths. So that, that we don't see with our eyes. But so the interpretation was that, okay, well, when we take light from different galaxies and we put it through a spectrometer, we could see the sort of chemical distribution because each chemical or each element on the periodic table has a certain uh, emission spectrum that, that is like a fingerprint that you know that, okay, I'm looking at carbon or I'm looking at uh, helium or I'm looking at whatever. So you can sort of get 
based on on the the emission spectrum of of light. So each that that's something that's just interesting about matter. Already early on, it was discovered over a century ago that there's a relationship between matter and 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 uh, light in that sense. There's a configuration that tells you something about the inner configuration or geometry of how the um, the nucleus is organized. Is it just random, right? Are the are the protons um, inside of the nucleus are they just randomly distributed, or is there are there specific configurations according to the qualitative identity of each uh, atom? What about the electrons, right? What determines the orbital, um, I don't, the, the geometry of the electrons around the nucleus? Is it random, or is there a specific correlation between the positive forces inside and the 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 geometry of where the electrons can go, right? So that's a that's just an interesting question. Yeah, to say. And by, you know, by the way, we but, never we never ask like our teachers. I never ask like what is an electron because we always you know work with that assumption. It's a particle. It's like okay, okay, yeah, thank yeah. you. You know, it's like on, okay, right? accepted. <laughs> so so all that to say, like so what what Halt and Arp discovered is that okay, when you look at the um, the emission spectrums of different galaxies, you can see that some of them are shifted towards the red and some of them, a few of them are shifted towards the blue side of things compared to what they would be if they were on the earth. So let's say carbon emission spectrums from the, the Andromeda galaxy would be shifted a little bit more towards the blue side of things versus the same carbon that would be something we can get off of Bunsenberger here on the earth. Um, and But most of them would be shifted towards the red. And it was presumed because the red, um, the, the, the red, it would imply that it's moving away from us because it has longer uh, wavelengths than the blue, which has shorter wavelengths. So using the Doppler hypothesis, it's, it's presumed that let's say Andromeda, which is shift towards the blue, all of the, the light coming out of that galaxy, it was presumed by that interpretation that it's moving towards the Milky Way, towards where we are. Whereas many of the things like quasars, a lot of the other galaxies being redshifted were moving away from us and they could calculate based on the rate of shift the amount of distance and speed each of these galaxies had relative to us. And based on that, there was this following logic, which was, well, now we can calculate when they were all together. If they're moving away from us, they must have been all together at some point. And we can then do a linear extrapolation into the past, which resulted in about 13.7 billion years ago. Okay, that's a mathematical conclusion you just made. And we are told that that is the absolute final truth. Now, the reality is that there's paradoxes to that, which are juicy, wonderful paradoxes that we are deprived of learning about because there's a suppression. Halton Arp, who was the student, as I mentioned, of Hubble, Hubble, who, by the way, said, don't interpret it this way, be careful, you're playing with fire. Uh, but but uh, he was a, um, Halton Arp was a, a leading scientist, a leading astronomer, and he produced in the late 60s a book called the appendix, or the, the, the uh, a manual, or a, 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 a book of, his compilation of peculiar galaxies. And it's a wonderful book. And uh, he got hammered. His career was really, it took a big hit, uh, but he did it because he's a moral human being committed to truth. And in this, in this compendium, um, and he recently died just in 2013, but he, and he gave wonderful lectures. I even, I even gave a lecture about this and wrote about this too. You could see the, the images of various galaxies that are, are have different redshifts of a very high degree. Like they would, they would be thousands of light years apart, but yet they are connected by filamentary structures, even though the redshifts are so different. Um, and there, there's often a statistically anomalous amount of quasars in between the uh, the filamentary structures connecting a lot of these galaxies. They're usually safer galaxies, and the quasars we're told are the they're the highest redshifted uh, entity in the known universe meaning they must be the furthest away from us. Now, according to what Halt and Arp is saying, no, because they're physically connected by obviously physical connections, they must actually be much closer both to themselves as well as maybe to even us than we realize. And that there is an intrinsic redshift. So the, the redshift is not a sign of Doppler effect. It's a sign of something intrinsic to each galaxy or quasar that is more indicative of its phase of evolutionary development, like an embryo. So the younger it would be, like the, the quasar, would be seeded from a parent galaxy. And the, the, the space-time within that galaxy, it's like a, a, a space-time field, would have an earlier uh, phase of evolution to it, indicating a certain uh, effect of a, a more red-shifted um, light system, whereas an older galaxy would be mo moving more towards the blue, implying that 
in our particular galactic cluster here in, uh, in the Milky Way because we're part of a galactic cluster of, of many galaxies. The only one that has a blue shift relative to us is Andromeda. So that would, not, that, would, that would mean in opposition to the nihilists who say there's no point of existence because we can calculate when we're all going to be destroyed by Andromeda slamming into the Earth in about 2 billion years. No, it actually means that what we're looking at with the blue shift of, Andr of Andromeda is that that's our, that's our parent galaxy that the Milky Way was generated out of. And, uh, and it totally shifts what is space, right? What is, what is this space between planets, between suns, between galaxies? It's actually this very, very living, vibrant, sat like ocean of, of, of substance. It's not the absence of substance. It's, and it's something that is in harmony with our souls that we can contemplate, that we can uh, investigate as we ourselves also embark upon a mental and also later physical exploration of that process that 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 creatively birthed us as individuals yeah. and birthed our planets within suns and birthed suns within galaxies and birthed galaxies within other more developed galaxies in a process that we still have a lot to figure out. It's highly fascinating because uh, there's a theory uh, because of the data astrophysicists have gathered or I I'm sure there's a lot of data that still are I don't know, not publicly accessible or or suppressed or whatever. But mm -hmm. there's this theory that in the next I don't know decades, uh, and you know, as you as you mentioned, we are part of this um, um, what do you call it, spiraling uh, one arm, like one spiraling arm of of this galaxy, of whatever of this galaxy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it seems to be that billions, you know, you said like bill, I know whatever, like four billions or thirteen billion years ago, the the Earth, you know, this tiny speck of dust, you know, was like. Uh, much further away from the center of this uh, spiraling arm of this galaxy. And now we are much closer. Well, you can see that, like literally, this is evidence, all right? So we're much closer to, the, uh, and, and we're being like, uh, by, by exponential speed, like being sucked more into the, towards the center of this galactical arm, which I don't know what that mean. I mean, does it mean like in a, in some time, whatever, in 50 years, 20 years, in 100 years, in hundreds of years, we're going to be sucked into the, into the center because the gravitational forces are going to be so strong that this speck of a dust, the Earth, with all the other planets, going to be sucked into because maybe it's just a natural cycle of the universe or all, you know, the cosmos or all universes. You know, like what I'm getting at. <laughs> Could that yeah, yeah, well, look, I, I I think that there's there's definitely um a certain uh like I, I I've heard people uh say there there's a common theory that that. Uh, we're also being slowly uh, sucked into the sun that that are um, that the sun's forces are uh, pulling us in and and that might have something to it that there's a certain rate of uh, decrease of the um, of the of the orbit of the earth and maybe even of the moon and other planets maybe but there's also modulation so what we also see is that in uh, in nature it's not simply these forces of attraction and repulsion pushing and pulling within empty space, which is sort of the consequence of the Newtonian tradition, uh, which has been a bit of a, 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 a perversion of science, I would say, which, which postulated, um, you know, in the 17, early 1700s, that what is fundamental is matter and space. And between this empty space, there is this uh, we, we have formulas that can calculate the relative rates of attraction and repulsion of things that just have these forces at, at you know. Um, but what would, now, what would you call those forces? Are those well, magnetical field, magnetic fields, gravitation? Because what so is gravity? The thing, like Newton's, Newton's formulas that, he, that we attribute to him, like the inverse square law is a good one, um, are actually derived from the previous works of uh, Johannes Kepler. And Johannes Kepler was an incredible Pythagorean Platonist, uh, a modern Pythagorean in the, in the best sense of the term. He was not a numerologist, but he believed and understood that there was a certain harmony of existence and that man's mind and God's mind have a, a certain harmony. Um, that's, the, that's the essentials of the Pythagorean sort of view. Um, but he was also very, there are, there are un irresponsible Pythagoreans who get a little bit too caught up in numerology as well. He was not one of those. Now, what Kepler did when he discovered gravity, um, like 80 years before Newton, um, what he was looking at was 
one in the new astronomy of 1609. He, uh, he has several chapters where he describes the magnetic force because he was reading the works of Michael Gilbert, who also was the person who discovered the magnetic nature of the, uh, the earth, um, a, Brit a very good British scientist. And Johannes Kepler was pursuing this as a, he described it a magnetic fluid that is emanating out of the, the rotating sun at the center of our, our solar system. Um, and this is part of his discovery. The first, he, he's well known for three fundamental laws. The first two in his new astronomy, where he postulates the magnetic hypothesis, uh, is where he discovered the, the elliptical nature of the planets, which is not an easy thing to do in those days. There was no satellites, right? So he discovered the elliptical nature and as a consequence, the, uh, the equal areas, equal times law, so that each planet you could take any two moments that are the same amount of time on the anywhere on any planetary orbit and find that the area swept out relative to the sun is equal, right? Equal areas, equal times. And this allowed him with this magnetic hypothesis, with these two laws to then reapproach the idea that was uh, published in his 1619 Harmonies of the, of the World, um, where his third law, his harmonic law is produced, which demonstrated that at the minimum and maximum moments, so each, each ellipse has a minimum and maximum boundary condition. It's not a circle. Circle, everything is the same all the, at every point on the circle, which is the only way people had known to do things before Kepler did what he did. In, a, in a, an ellipse, you have a point of maximum um, speed, where, where every planet moves the fastest, you know, also it's the hottest in the summertime where we're at the closest to the, 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 the sun and a, a slowest point where we're the furthest away from the sun, the, we're, we're the furthest away from this uh, force, so-called. Now, that is something that it's called harmonic because he discovered that there was a certain relationship of, that is in, that is in accord with the, the proportions that we can find on a, a, a well-tempered musical string, which produces several octaves, where we could find the geometry, the divisions on a, on a string that produce the harmonic sounds that we make music with. And we've been doing it intuitively for thousands of years. You can, you can find flutes from 30,000 years ago that have the holes uh, designed in such a way that they are equal tempered holes. Uh, so the human soul, even before the knowledge the, the the mind was able to uh, make its discoveries was already resonating to this through music. But Kepler took it to the next level by demonstrating that it's also built into the organizational structure of our solar system, which is how he then discovered his third law, the, the, um, the cubic average distance of each uh, planet to the sun has a certain relationship to the, the square of the period of the sun as a whole that has that relationship maintains itself through all of the planets but he discovered it see if you if you're in school today we're talking about the bad form of teaching what they teach you is that it's you only need to memorize the formula of what kepler did to pass the test you only need to memorize the formula of what newton did of the inverse square law which is a consequence of what kepler just did but you you're not allowed to get into kepler's mind you're not you're not encouraged to ever read his books and where he lays out how what are the paradoxes he was wrestling with that allowed him to generate the hypothesis that broke free of the standard models of his day that made society able to break out of that that closed framework where priesthood was was controlling the terms of science and also of religion before kepler was did battle and to this very day his discoveries have been suppressed newton was a synthetic creation by all evidence that I've seen, um, which simply came out of the Royal Society of London. I mean, Newton himself was a political operative. He was the the head, um, the secretary of the mint of the Bank of England. Yeah, I think that's the only thing I think he really, like, ha I mean, uh, sort of produced a benefit to humanity. Isn't that like with the gold? No, there was no benefit to humanity uh, there. The, the Bank of England was a parasitical pox. <laughs> yeah, <that>. exactly. <laughs> uh, he was, a, he was a calculating machine who was also sociopathic. Like he's famed for, as head of the Royal Society and heading the mint, he did a uh, what's called the, the Recoinage Act, which was a massive theft of the people where they basically um, brought in, they called in a, a recalling of, of coins, uh, cl clipped them, reissued coins that had like less metallic value. Yeah. And for people who were rendered into poverty because of this this theft of the people and were forced to do a counterfeit 
which is what was going on by by nature of what was uh, he gave everybody the death penalty. It was his choice to determine whether people just go to prison. Do they go to the dungeon? Do they get tortured? Oh my God! Uh, him, I didn't know that. Jesus! Every single time like he gave torture. The rock star, you know, of whatever, you know, like. <laughs> no, no, no. This guy was, and he never discussed. If you actually look for like, what is the evidence of his actual having discovered? Like, where where is the work that demonstrates what he discovered? How he was thinking when he made all of these discoveries of the calculus and everything. Uh, which, by the way, was also discovered by Kepler's follower, Gottfried Leibniz, um, who was an enemy of Newton. Um, Newton actually didn't. There's none. There's none of that. We are told that he his dog uh, knocked over a candle that lit his his laboratory on fire that burnt all of his ma manuscripts, which is why we don't have any evidence. That's the, the mythology was, that was created. And finally, when John Maynard Keynes um, w <laughs> bought at auction a uh, Newton's chest that somebody had found in, in the basements of, of Cambridge and he bought it and had a big press conference. Cause now when he, he was going to open it and finally show the world, these thousands of manuscripts of how Newton made his discoveries of gravity and everything else. Um, he opened it and there was no science in there. It was all black magic, numerology, uh, al alchemy, trying to pursue uh, the philosopher's stone. The guy was a nut job, a Rosicrucian <laughs> Freemasonic nut job. Um, and, and sociopathic. He was, he was by all evidence, simply a synthetic shell of a nothing who is used to as, as sort of a marketing tool to obscure and destroy the flow of science and get people into a, a mode of thinking that had them in memorizing formulas that they would then apply like computers instead of knowing the causes of things. And great scientists like Max Planck, I'll even throw in Einstein, even though he had problems uh, in the modern age, any of the great scientists who really made penetrating discoveries broke away from the Newtonian way of thinking and got out of that in a, in a more Keplerian mode. So we're not told about any of that. And, and all that to say to your question on, on the earth going into the, the, uh, the center of the, the galaxy or, or into the, uh, our, our solar system or into the, into the sun, I would say that there's, there's something about, if you, if you look at the force, the real force is a harmonic law. There's a modulating coherence. And in harm, in harmony, you tend to have like a modulation of, of like a, a breathing. Now, that doesn't mean that, that the, the sun or the galaxy are eternal. They are, they are, after all, physical objects, and all physical objects with boundary conditions that have a start and an end, they are, they are limited. Um, they're, they're, that's, not, that's not where the domain of justice exists. Justice doesn't have a beginning or middle or an end or a space. You can't cut justice in half. You could see expressions of justice in events, but that's not justice. That's an expression of justice. It's different. So planets, you could say, okay, they're probably going to come to an end. And that does mean that we, do, we should be thinking about the broader meaning of what it means to be a human being contemplating these things with the capacity of either one, maybe eventually influencing or, or, or uh, changing the, the eventual um, destruction of our sun, which in all likelihood, it might go supernova at some point. So we should probably start thinking maybe what is going on inside the sun? What, or is there anything we can do to maybe like prolong the life, the duration of life of the sun? Or also at the same time, maybe also thinking about terraforming other planets, getting into new ways of, of thinking about how we can expand the, the growth of life and human civilization, both first in our solar system. Maybe first we'd want to practice on greening some deserts on the earth to like start figuring yeah. <laughs> just to you know? <laughs> but then maybe in 80, 90 years, we could start maybe applying this slowly to experiment with Mars, maybe Europa or Io. Be, you know, there's a lot, there's like over a hundred, I don't know how many, there's a lot of, uh, of moons in our solar system with all sorts of interesting uh, variations to explore and expand. And then maybe beyond that, thinking about, okay, along the way, we might come up with discoveries that allow us to, to go to um, Alpha Centauri, maybe, you know, Um and maybe we, we could have that transgenerational type of intention that governs our policy and our ethic um, that allows us to, when the time comes, maybe we won't necessarily be forced to be extinguished with the other planets in our solar system when the sun decides, okay, it's had enough. Uh, and maybe we'll be in another part of the galaxy or maybe eventually down the line, you know, in, in thousands or, or more years in other galaxies even. Who knows? I don't know. But the point is, it's a very optimistic way of thinking which you don't get if you just listen to, I mean, if you're just watching modern Hollywood movies for the past 40 years, the majority, I'd say 99.9%, .9 when they talk about the future, they're going to leave you 
subliminally with a very bad taste in your mouth about that's where aliens go to kill us. Yeah, especially uh, especially when you when you know you know who funds these movies. You know, like <laughs> come on, yeah, like exactly. the Department of Defense, Pentagon. It's like it's so crazy. You know, like uh, yeah. the deliberate, like uh, fo- you know, very uh, agenda like you know finance uh, financing and budgeting predictive programming. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So uh, we went like into really fascinating rabbit holes. Um, and you know, I improvised the title. I just wrote, you know, "Freedom, Peace, and Exponential Technological Evolution" or something like that for for this. Yeah. <laughs> and because I wanted, to, I, I I did want, I, I did have the intention to talk to you about, you know, money, you know, and I would love you to maybe some some other time. I'm I'm going to coordinate this, you know, more like long term together. You with uh, Jeff Booth and um, maybe you know, is he Canadian too? You know, so so I thought. Um, uh, you know the separation of money and state, uh, uh, the uh, um, the deflationary aspects of Bitcoin. You know what a society, civilization can look like under deflationary money with a with a money. You know because we're why we're so obsessed again with Bitcoin because it it it. Um, it really changes everything. It transforms every structural, you know, problem we have. You know, especially when you when we separate money and state, when you finally you know, change the incentivization game, uh, when we finally, you know, we we've been talking like you know, about education, science, technology, about this all, you know, brainwashing. So this, we can like open up, we can thrive and blossom. You know, and 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 again, you know, I'm totally convinced, and I know, and you know, I I don't know what I don't know, but. Um, but there's just so much that is so compartmentalized, so suppressed, especially when we talk about, you know, the military industrial complex, which again, your wife talked about, uh, you know, the suppression of technology. So this is why Bitcoin is such a, you know, huge, uh, you know, and, and, and irreversible vision uh, because, you know, you cannot put the genie into the bottle. It's, it's already too late. It's 13 years past. It's. Uh, not confiscatable. It's hardest, scarcest money we've ever had. There's only 21 million. It is totally decentralized and distributed. It is censorship resistant. And, you know, now we're building layers and layers on top of it. And what I would love you, you know, to, to just, you know, look into it and, and because you would be, you know, the perfect candidate to put this all together, you know, together with your wife. So there's a vision I have, I and mean, I'm sure, you know, many others have. Okay, but- <laughs> yeah, look, man, I mean, you know, we, we, we chatted about this last time, too. And I, I think that there's certainly, in, in my view, okay, I think that there's a, a very important role for Bitcoin in, in the world feasibly. I, I'm, I'm, I'm more lukewarm on it, honestly, than you, than you are. Um, but, you know, I, I don't see it as being like a lot of people would say this is a purely, uh, I, I know a lot of people who, who just try to dismiss this as being a purely tulip bubble uh, scheme. Um, I don't think that that's true. I think it, it could be misused uh, feasibly. And I, that's all the thing. But I, I see it as feasibly playing a very important role in, in a good, healthy society that is moving forward in a creative way. Um, I'm, again, a little bit more lukewarm on some of the elements around it, on libertarianism and other things. Uh, you know, I, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm okay with national banking and things like that. Uh, but that's a whole other conversation. I, I, uh, yeah, we could talk about that maybe in the future. Yeah, yeah, but maybe we need to start, you know, start talking about, it, especially you know, from Earth perspective. Like, what do you think about, you know, the inflation that's going on? The, 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 the you know, the oh, trillions and trillions. The of, system of, is a time bomb. Yeah, the system, the know? system, uh, created to be a hyperinflationary time bomb back when the dollar was taken off the gold standard or the gold reserve back in seventy one by Kissinger or and George Schultz. Uh, but it was designed to blow. I mean, that, that there was it, this system was never designed to be perpetual. It was designed to blow by those who killed Kennedy. And his brother Robert in '68 afterwards. Um, so the idea was always to do um, a meltdown, like in, in 1929, which was another controlled bubble that was designed to pop in order to bring in eugenics and fascism as the miracle economic solutions run by an international bankers' cabal in London and their Wall Street lackeys. Um, that Newton, Isaac Newton himself, was also a part of the uh, the South Sea speculative bubble in uh, the 1720s that was also designed to blow. Now, Newton himself, just to show how he was himself just used, uh, lost his whole fortune gambling off this thing. Um, But those who were at the top who understood the bubble were able to do a massive wealth transfer um, at the same time. So uh, bubbles pop, our system is a time bomb. Yes, it is a hyperinflationary time bomb. Yeah, I agree. But what would be just to wrap this up? I mean, what would be like if you could just you know give a glimpse like into your thinking? Like, what would be the 
the, the most effective, you know, most rational, ethical, uh, logical um, solution uh, to, to, okay. all, to many of these symptoms. I'll send you. I'll send you an article I did, and maybe you can share with your your. Uh... I, I wrote I wrote two books uh, recently, um, co-written by with my wife. Actually, congratulations! Well, was it the one? Uh, it just I saw uh, some kind of picture of it. Uh, untold histories of. Well, the untold histories of Canada was a series of four books I okay. produced a few years ago. Um, this is a follow-up called "The Clash of the Two Americas," Volume One and Volume Two. And Volume One I, we published about four months ago, which tackled the USA from 1774 until 1890. Uh, and, and it was from the standpoint, as the title implies, the clash of the two Americas. So this deep state parasite, which was always there. It's not a new thing. It was always there. It's, it's been this Anglo-American hive that never left after the revolution and was, has always been working to subvert from within versus the better America, which, which is the constitutional America uh, that we know and love. Um, which every, every American president who dies in office, and there's been eight of them, plus Bobby Kennedy, you know, uh, who is about to become president, that would make nine. Um, they're all invoking the exact same constitutional principles of banking, protective tariffs, national credit for, for large scale infrastructure development, at shutting down the Anglo American uh, controls of Wall Street, um, which were themselves created by Aaron Burr's assassin, uh, Alexander Hamilton's assassin, Aaron Burr. He's sort of the founding father of, modern, of the modern deep state who created. The Bank of Manhattan, who created Wall Street in 18, uh, 1798. So that story goes through uh, volume, that's volume one, it goes through Lincoln's greenbacks, what Lincoln did to take the power away from Wall Street, how he funded the transcontinental foreign policy, how he was able to, to work with other Nate or how, how his followers like Ulysses Grant, uh, Garfield also assassinated, uh, McKinley, uh, James Blaine, the great secretary of state, how they were able to organize with other other Republican humanist leaders around the world uh, for a system of sovereign nation states that would be cooperating under win-win cooperation and, and big projects with national banks uh, that would be not controlled by the private central banking cartels that, again, that's what Newton was part of innovating. Um, and then volume two that we just published a few weeks ago uh, has John F. Kennedy on the cover with Zbigniew Brzezinski, and it tackles 1890 until a bit of the future. Um, going through the 20th century with 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 sort of six different sections, about eight chapters each, um, going through how World War I was manufactured, what was destroyed there, how World War II was manufactured, how the Great Depression was manufactured, how Franklin Roosevelt fought back against this central banker's cabal, how he took their power away. A lot of these untold histories of the U.S. were told there. Um, and then ultimately towards the end, um, we get it how the reactivation of this principle of American system uh, political economy has arisen once more with the Eurasian, uh, the greater Eurasian partnership right now. And that's why sovereign nation states have been targeted for destruction by this one world government cabal. They want to get rid of sovereign nation states and they want to reduce the world population because sovereign nation states were created by the people to, to use as a weapon to fight against this this oligarchical uh, structure. Um, they're trying to get us to turn to, to the, the oligarchy has taken over many of the institutions of sovereign nation states. That's the deep state everywhere. It's in Russia. It's in China. Now in Russia and China, they've actually fought back. Whereas here we've succumbed in the West. Um, so that's sort of the book two. And maybe if you want to have a, a, I could send you, I'll send you free PDFs to you personally. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so you, you could look at them um, if you have people that you would want to share them with. But a lot of my ideas of solutions go through that. And within that idea of national banking, protective tariffs, the, the use of the sovereign nation state to break the controls of the military industrial complex. Um, I think, again, Bitcoin might be able to play it. Not I think it could very easily play a very positive role. Yeah. Um, but that that's part of my equation that I that I know is not part of uh, the equation of either Catherine Austin Fitz or many of the people in the Bitcoin community these days. And she's I'm not even Bitcoin, that, by the way. You know, she's like totally negative towards that. This is something that's yeah. mind boggling a little bit. But but it's okay. You know, maybe she doesn't understand the it. Conversation has to happen at some point. I I, I think she's probably honest. Um. So yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, the the conversation should just be broached. Okay, where can you buy the book? Can you buy it on Amazon too, or or where's yeah, it? I mean, people can go to the easiest way to find it, I guess, is just to go to my my website, CanadianPatriot.org. Uh -huh. 
and uh, you'll see immediately banners saying buy the book and you can just click buy the book and it'll take you to all of my books um which go to you know you can buy them on amazon or write me a message i could send you one oh, directly you know, better. physical yeah. copies yeah mm -hmm. cool. uh i know you're not uh, very active on twitter but uh people can find you on linkedin where else can uh, any other informational resources or uh, links? uh if they type in rising tide foundation on telegram um, I'm trying to use Telegram more um, as yeah. as a social media outlet. I just began. Um, the, I would recommend that because I, I, my wife and I, we manage uh, RisingTideFoundation.net. Uh -huh. It's a nonprofit organization here yeah. in Canada. And um, otherwise, they could find me on. Uh, I would just say just use RisingTideFoundation.net or, or CanadianPatriot.org. Yeah, we, we're on Facebook, but we're trying to migrate off of that thing. Yeah, you know, yeah, maybe definitely. VK or something, but. It, under under decided yet? I, I yeah, and you should get on Getter. On Getter, I mean, it seems f so far, you know, lots of people, even Joe Rogan, now went on Getter because of this. I mean, yeah. mind-boggling. I mean, incredible censorship. You know, after I, mean, I don't know whether you listen to. Uh, there's an interview with Robert Malone, Doctor. Yeah, I saw that. That's good. Yeah, it's amazing. And yeah. so you know, Getter could be really, really the alternative. But I think long term, it's going to be like I think we're striving for a really decentralized platform. Um, but yeah, um, hey, um, uh, Matthew, I really enjoyed our talk as always. We went like into all kinds of different rabbit holes. Um, yeah, any final thoughts or? Um... Um, I think that uh, we hit a lot. There's a lot of material. <laughs> Lots of I don't even know how to summarize all these points, but I'll yeah, try. Uh, definitely, do. I would say take home of you here is one has to really um, beef up their we all, we all have to beef up our spiritual and uh, cognitive infrastructure because we're going to have more and more responsibility to be courageous and to be communicators of ideas that cannot be done overly literally, which requires work. Um, the, the best thing I could say to people is um, as far as like we all we go to the gym, we try to eat right, uh, but we often neglect the health and um, exercise of our minds. And so if you want my advice, honestly, if you're listening to this is turn off social media, turn off Netflix <laughs> and read some core Plato dialogues. Uh -huh. um, spend a few weeks just reading Plato, taking notes and, and writing your thoughts as they come to you, because this is a muscle that you are going to be building. You're going to need it. Mm -hmm. um, read some of the classics, like uh, even new things, edifying things like Helen Keller, and her essays on optimism, why Helen Keller, the woman born or, or who lost her hearing and her sight when she was a baby, how she was able to become a powerful soul that that taught Shakespeare, that, that mastered several languages and was an incredible powerhouse of intellect. Um, read her, her essays on, on how she thinks and how she came to that because the question of, is, was she a fool for being dumb, uh, for being um, optimistic about human nature? Uh -huh. Or was she, did she understand evil and despite her understanding of evil, choose to become a reasonable uh, optimist because she was and she understood evil. We, um, so I would say just read things that edify, but also empower that are difficult to read and, and write your thoughts down a lot. And as you do that, get practice communicating in nonlinear ways. Um, the, I would just say that in, you know, the Rising Tide Foundation, we're doing lectures every week. Um Okay. We've been doing that for about two years every Sunday, uh, where we have different experts, different different people on. Do you pre-announce like topics, like whatever that is, technology or or what you know things? Yeah. Like that, sure. Things yeah, we can um, go to anybody goes to risingtidefoundation.net. Go to the the top menu bar. You could see symposia. Mm -hmm. Click on that, and that'll take you through the menu of all of the past symposiums that we've organized since 2019 on different topics of, like you said, science, literature, history, philosophy, it's all there. And uh, if you want to be involved, usually I ask people to make a donation of any sure. any sum yeah, yeah. and then uh, send me a, an email saying that you're interested and then you'll, you will go on our list mm -hmm. uh, of, of receiving the, the weekly Zoom links. And uh, that also includes Substack. So Cynthia and myself, we write for Substack. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very important way that we're able to both get our message out there in a non-censored way mm -hmm. and also to raise funds so right. people can get a free Substack subscription to us or they can do the paid option. And then that also gives you all access to our, our books, PDFs, uh, the the lecture invitations, everything else. That's so great. you can yeah. do it that way too. 
And if you don't mind, I mean, I would love to, you know, recommend you to, for other podcasts. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we've been learning so much from from you and and your wife. You know, it's it's amazing knowledge. I mean, uh, it's so much to 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 contemplate upon. But anyway, um, um, so Matthew, I hope you know to talk to you soon. I, I'll try. You know, if you're still open minded for this discussion, that we could, you know, co organize, coordinate with Jeff Booth or whoever, you know, someone you know who could we could just sort of uh, just you know have a, have a fruitful dis discussion. Uh, that'd be amazing. So, uh, yeah, thanks again and uh, Happy New Year, by the way. Happy New Year to you too and your loved ones. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, you so bye. much. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. Okay, um, that's for today now. That was a mind-boggling, really, uh, really deep, deep, deep rabbit hole, rabbit holes. Uh, again, um, uh, you can find Matthew Arid uh, or Matt on uh, Twitter, but he's not active. You can find him LinkedIn, uh, risingtidefoundation.net. Uh, I'm going to put this all in the show notes. And yeah, and by the way, if you haven't bought Bitcoin yet or you haven't read any Bitcoin books yet, I can definitely recommend the Bitcoin standard by Safed and Amus, the fiat standard uh, <laughs> sort of as a... Um, a very, very deep, deep, uh, you know, understanding of how the fiat, uh, how the fiat came upon, and you know, the the gold standard, and what the, what the disadvantages were, and w uh, why Bitcoin, you know, is the ultimate solution to everything else. So I can really, really uh, um, recommend this book to you, and yeah, and get yourself a hardware wallet if you haven't bought any, if you have bought any 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 kind of any amount of Bitcoin. Uh, get them off your exchanges. This, your, not your keys, not your coins. And uh, you know, I've got all kinds of you know links with uh, discount codes uh, by from Bitbox zero uh, two, a Bitcoin only, of course, wallet. Uh, um, then uh, the best one is of course Cold Card by Coinkite. You know, most paranoid, most you know, e really accessible, really e user friendly. Also, if you just you know uh, follow the instructions. And yeah, follow me on Twitter. And uh, if you have any suggestions or uh, follow up questions or any suggestions for future discussions or recommendations, or you know anybody inside whistleblowers experts uh, whom I can bring together, for example, Matthew Arid, I'm really respect and uh, really grateful for, for you know, uh, sharing his knowledge. Again, thank you so much again for listening. And I'll talk to you soon. My name is Kay Van Davani, the host of the Kay Van Davani Connection Show. Happy New Year, 2022, bye.